And so we are continuing with our company law discussion, and we would like to discuss financing the company, or what we call it the corporate uh, finance. So before we discuss the law itself, uh, let me uh, touch on a few uh, uh, preliminary things uh, which we need to have at the back of our mind as we discuss the specifics of the law in relation to uh, corporate finance. So first of all, we have used uh, the word uh, capital, that is corporate finance, uh, funding the, the company. And the analogy which uh, some test writers, uh, for example, use, uh, including my own friend, Mr. Daji, will be that uh, just as a person, you know, you are born, you go to school and all that, the person who is going to provide resources or money to fund your upbringing, to fund your education and all that, certainly uh, your parents or whoever is standing in local parents, standing in a position of a parent uh, towards you. So that, and of course, uh, some other well wishes who may also want to support you. So uh, in funding uh, the natural person for him or her, to develop himself, we are quite uh, clear about uh, how the situation is. Uh, however, when you come to the corporate uh, entity, and you come to the corporate, uh, uh, maybe let me say this, uh, you don't need to have your video on, uh, unless you really want to, because it's not important. In myself, I tend to switch my video off. Uh, yeah, okay, thank you. Yeah, so if you take the uh, the company, the, which is the official legal entity, it is not set up just for the fun of it. It is set up, or it is incorporated to achieve or realize certain objects, certain purposes. And as you remember, when we discuss the mechanics of incorporation, that is the processes that we go through to get the company incorporated, to get the company brought into existence. Uh, you notice that uh, part of the things that you are supposed to for example, provide, if you remember session 13, if you go to session 13, uh, subsection two of the Companies Act 2019, Act 992, uh, it is uh, you know, required by law that the application for registration of a company to become an incorporated company must, among other things, uh, state the nature of the proposed business in the case of a company registered with, what, with an object. I mean, the presupposition is that you don't acquire the vehicle. We don't acquire the, the corporate uh, uh, vehicle. That's for the sheer fun of it. I mean, no uh, rational uh, being uh, will just go through the processes of registering the company just because you just want to have a company. Certainly, you have a certain object. You have a certain purpose. For which reason you are incorporating the company? You want to do business. Uh, you want to, for example, make profits. Or uh, you want to do some other things. At least you have some purpose. But for uh, this aspect of the course, I think our main focus is on the company limited by shares. As we saw last semester, that is a company which by law, it is required to be registered with shares. So that is our focus. So therefore, where you have incorporated or registered a company limited by shares, you have a purpose. Now, the question is, 
how do you achieve that purpose? How do you uh, ensure that the incorporated company is able to run? It all comes back to money. It comes back to money. And in the business, just as we natural uh, you know, persons, oxygen is our life. Without oxygen, we will definitely uh, die. In the same vein, you cannot have an incorporated company, especially company limited by shares, and be zero on cash or below on cash. You need money. You need money to oil the wheels of the corporate vehicle. Now, that brings up the issue. If money is needed to enable the incorporated company, limited by shares, to realize its objects, what are the sources of money uh, which may be uh, drawn upon by the incorporated company? Well, if you look at the reality of business life and also traditionally how the company is uh, run, uh, two uh, main sources are available. So we have the, well, I mean, uh, what do you call it? Like the uh, shares, that is the uh, equity capital, and then uh, we also have what we call like the, the debt capital, that is the venture. Uh, to put it in a very uh, simple uh, form, before we look at the law uh, further, uh, it suffices just to uh, appreciate that. You, we could just say that the money for the company is the capital, the capital of the company, right? And this capital has got two uh, forms. A component which is made available by the members of the company, those who have, if you like, ownership stake for want of better word, because uh, from your discussion of Solomon and Solomon and then the doctrine of separate legal personality, it may be a bit of abuse of legal doctrine to say that those who have ownership uh, interest, because as we know, the company has the capacity to actually uh, own uh, things and so on in its own right, quite apart from wherever the members and shareholders are. But just for our present purpose, we mean uh, those who stand to benefit from any uh, profits which the company may make, and those who stand to lose uh, directly uh, from losses which the company may incur. So what we call are the members, uh, the shareholders. So monies made available by the members or the shareholders is an important uh, aspect of uh, corporate finance, the capital available to the company. And the other component of funding available to the company is what you call uh, debt funding or borrowing. Uh, what do you mean by uh, borrowing? That is where the company will go to non-members or even uh, members, as the case may be, and say that, uh, can you lend us money on agreed terms? So there may be certain interests we pay to you at certain times and so on and so forth. Now, in, in the technical sense, we call that debentures, right? So later on, we discuss uh, debentures as uh, uh, a documentary acknowledgement of debts by the, the company, uh, subject to few exceptions. So these are the things we should have at the back of our mind uh, before we proceed to discuss the various component of our corporate finance. But maybe before we also move on, a little bit of uh, business thinking, a little bit of economics. So therefore, 
uh, where the company, for example, has to make choices. You know, if the company really needs money, uh, should the company move more towards uh, getting money for members in the form of shares? Or should the company go and borrow in the form of debentures? So each of the two options uh, has got its own uh, downside. Now, where the company goes to borrow, uh, the money will have to be paid back. So when the money is paid back, uh, those, the creditors, those who lend money to the company, uh, we bid them farewell out of the company. They have no dealing with the company again. So uh, that is fine. And to large extent, they also don't have any say in decision-making or governance of the company again. That is fine. But for, if you decide, you know, the, the other challenge, of course, is also that uh, where we have crisis in the business and you know, crises are everywhere, even uh, in our country within the, the macro economy, we are all witnesses of uh, a crisis, uh, which are not anticipated by anybody. So the same thing can also happen in the, in the business, in the life of like a, a business entity. So uh, the company is not able to abide by, let's say, the agreed payment terms. The debenture holders or the creditors may, for example, hold the company to ransom by trying to, uh, for example, enforce uh, maybe certain uh, security arrangements which the company made uh, to, I mean, in return for the, the loan or the borrowing which uh, the company had. And that could actually make things difficult for the company. So that is uh, one thing that we should keep uh, in mind. Again, uh, if the company decide to ignore borrowing and rather embrace uh, raising money from the members or what they call like the shareholders, uh, there are many uh, benefits because as we know, by reason of the doctrine of uh, limited liability concept. Remember limited liability concept? A limited liability concept, we learned uh, uh, in the last semester that uh, where you are a shareholder, for example, you have shares in the company, should the company, for example, uh, become uh, insolvent or is unable to uh, pay uh, its debts, you as a shareholder, uh, all that you stand to lose is the money that you pay for the shares and also where you have not finished uh, paying for the shares which were allotted uh, to you, then the unpaid value is all that you'll be asked to come and pay. And once you have settled any outstanding uh, balance on the shares issued to you, even if the company is still owing, you cannot be asked to make further payment because your liability is limited to the amount of money uh, unpaid on the shares that you have. Or put differently, your liability does not extend beyond the total value of shares which have been given to you. Yeah, so uh, one will say that then it is better for the company to actually uh, go in for, uh, for shares since the risk is relatively uh, lower. Now, having said that, I would like us to come back to uh, the law and then uh, take uh, the various uh, aspects uh, of it as we do, and then we move on. But before we uh, move on, uh, the law we are going to focus on mainly now is the part F of the uh, Companies Act uh, 2019 Act 992. And uh, 
as I always tell you, if you want to uh, learn the law, you come across a concept which you are meeting in a very formal way for the first time, rush to the interpretation session of the law and try and find out uh, what that concept means. So let's go to schedule one. So if you go to uh, schedule one, uh, schedule one is at the page uh, 308. Uh, uh, shares have been uh, defined uh, over there. And I would like us to uh, look at uh, what uh, shares means according to the definition provided in the first schedule. I've just jumped there, as you can see. Yeah, so uh, if you go to schedule one, uh, the lawmaker has defined shares as meaning quote. Shares mean the interest of members of a body corporate who are entitled to share in the capital or income of of the body corporate. So the interests of members of a body corporate who are entitled to share in the capital or income of the body corporate. So that is the meaning of share. And let me draw your attention to this. If you look at how the lawmaker provided the definition, there's a certain uh, controlling uh, uh, word. Uh, and that is mean. So uh, because of the use of the word mean, the definition is quite stipulative. The definition is exhaustive. In other words, what shares means is all that provided here. And we cannot extrapolate or we cannot uh, bring uh, some other uh, things to be uh, put or subsumed under the concept or the doctrine shares. So for purposes of company law, especially in our country, speaking in reference to Act 992, uh, shares refers to interests of members of a body corporate uh, who are entitled to share either in the capital or income of the body corporate. Now let me explain that a little bit more before uh, we go back to look at uh, session uh, 42. Uh, so we said interest. So shares is like a stake. A stake you have in an incorporated uh, entity, so body corporate. And that is why we, we cannot say that you have shares in a sole proprietorship or I'm the sole shareholder of my uh, enterprise. When you know that the enterprise has not been incorporated or registered as a body corporate, that will be abuse of uh, legal uh, language. Uh, so uh, shares means the stake or the interest which you have in uh, an incorporated uh, entity or body uh, corporate. Now, what sort of interest is that? Or what sort of stake? Uh, your stake or interest in relation to the capital or income of the body corporate. If we say uh, capital, uh, by capital here, we are referring to uh, totality of, if you like, uh, the non-liquid uh, uh, or non-cash uh, you know, assets of the company, uh, so to speak. So that if uh, the company, for example, was closing down, uh, winding up, especially members voluntary winding up and so on, meaning that the company is very solvent. It is able to pay its debts and liabilities. It's not owing anybody. And it has still got a number of uh, surplus assets. So we need to uh, distribute it. So 
if you are a shareholder, by reason of your interest as a shareholder, you will be able to participate in the distribution of uh, those surplus assets, which you call uh, the capital, which we are giving to uh, the members. Or uh, income. So by the income here, uh, of course, uh, it refers to money, but uh, more importantly, uh, later on you come to notice that uh, the, the financial benefit which inures to uh, a shareholder or uh, a member of a, a company limited by shares is what we call like the, the dividends. Uh, when profits are declared, the portion of the profit which is distributed to shareholders, the dividends. So if you are a shareholder, then you are entitled to get that. So the takeaway from the statutory definition of shares as per so the one of companies uh, act 2019 at 992 is that share is interest, right? Is the uh, interest of members in incorporated uh, company. Uh, and by that interest, if the assets of the company have been distributed, they're entitled to enjoy or take part in it, or where the funds of the company are being, for example, uh, split or returned to the members, or if the company has been so successful and we have surplus money to be shared as profit and order, they are also entitled to get the same. Yeah, so that is uh, what we should uh, keep uh, in mind. Now. now let's go back to the specific of the provision we were actually discussing. So let's go to section 42. Uh, now, having had the general statutory definition of shares as the interest of members uh, in a, a body corporate with respect to capital or income, uh, we need to understand uh, you know, other things like if you no know, legally, what are the various characteristics? What are the various uh, futures? Or what are the incidents of a share? If we talk about a share, what are the characteristics or the incidents as it were? And for that matter, if you look at section 42, you no, know, if you look at section 42, the sectional uh, you no know, heading says legal nature of what of shares. So uh, those are what we have. So first, uh, shares of a company in a, shares of member in a company are movable property, a movable property. And that is uh, very uh, important. Uh, let us keep that in mind. What does it mean to say that it is movable property? We know that uh, we have two things. Either something is immovable property or something is what? Movable uh, property. So if it is immovable, uh, that is to say that it is in relation to uh, land. But uh, on this particular occasion, the provision is quite clear that uh, shares uh, are movable. That is, it should not be treated as anything in the nature of a landed uh, property. Now, that also means that shares is a, a shows in action. Uh, shares is a shows in action. If I say shows in action, let me uh, um, no, shows. That is a C H O S C. Let me try to write it here. Okay. Yeah, shows in action. I don't know if uh, if one of you can confirm if you are seeing what I'm written. Can you see it? I'm holding it. Are you seeing no. the one I've written in the chat? No, please. No, sir. 
Oh, really? Okay. But can you see the screen? Yes, sir. Okay, then let me attempt to use the white board. Can you see now? Yes, sir. Okay. So, uh, we are saying that uh, being a uh, movable property, it is uh, also a particular type. It is a shows in action. It's not a shows in possession. So that is very important. Uh, and saying that a share is a, a shows in action, uh, I would like to uh, quote for you, uh, a very uh, 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 old case, the case of uh, Talkington and McGee. That's uh, the that's the dictum which is important. So uh, don't worry about uh, the entire fact as well. Just trying to locate my whiteboard, but I don't know, I'm not getting it today. Mm -hmm. Yes, if, let me stop and then I'll come back to the screen. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the money word is there. Just loading the white board in a, a second. Okay. Uh, just a second, it's loading. Oh. Okay, I think let's improvise. Uh, if the high board, we can use the word and then we'll be able to do our own thing. Just a minute. Let's use our. Uh, 
Okay, so let me write on this receipt. Yeah, so this I mentioned is talk uh, yes of a uh, meeting. Especially if you look at the page four, there is a uh, the chat uh, that says channel G. Provided a definition of uh, uh, shows in action, uh, which I think uh, is worth uh, quoting. And he said that, quote, shows in action is, is a, a known legal expression used to describe all personal rights of property, which can only be claimed or enforced by action and not by taking physical possession. He continues, I'm unable to understand what personal right of property anyone has in a mere name so as to sell or purchase it. Claim B is equally untidy and vague yours claim. A letter written by one man to another concerning their Mutual transaction and copy to train switching is to be set aside by a court of law on application of a stranger to the transaction. I confess, I do not appreciate what possible purpose such a court order can be reasonably expected to accomplish, nor do I think Claim C should be dignified by any comment. And I ignore it completely, unquote. Now, and yes, student, what is important for our present discussion is the one particular sentence in the dictum of uh, Justice Chanel in Talkington and Magee, 1902-2KB-422-430, uh, which I have quoted already and then I'm repeating it. Shows in action is used to describe all personal rights of property which can only be claimed or enforced by action and not by taking physical possession. So by action here, as we've already uh, noticed, refers to uh, a legal action, a suit, a suit. So the takeaway is that a shows in action refers to any interest in law, which is enforceable or realizable by uh, a court, uh, uh, order or a court action, as the case may be. If, if you think that someone has violated an interest you have, which the law reckons as a shows in action, you cannot resort to self-help measures, right. such as taking physical possession. You must rather uh, go to court and uh, let the court uh, ventilate uh, your grievance or vindicate uh, your claim. Yeah, so that is what you should keep in mind. So if you actually apply this to shares in a company, where, for example, you're a shareholder and uh, you think that the company has not been declaring uh, shares and so on, you don't have the power or it doesn't lie in your power to go and you know, take over certain machinery or certain equipment of the company. Because you think that for five years now, uh, that's why the fact that you have shares in the company, no dividends have been declared, no. Uh, if you do that, you'll be on the wrong side of the law because 
Uh, a share is a shows in possession. It is movable property and also a shows in what? In possession. So let's keep uh, that in mind. And then somebody has something in the chat. Let us see what the person. Okay. Okay, so thank you, uh, Charles uh, Tung, for uh, dwelling on your knowledge in Bedu and Sam, which we met uh, last uh, semester. Thank you. Now, uh, the other point maybe I should also say is that uh, a share can also be will, right? You can make a will in respect of your share. Share can be gifted in survivors or by testamentary disposition. Uh, in survivors simply means that you can give a share as a gift. Maybe the next time is going to be your friend's birthday. If you have a share in the company, you can probably write to the person that you are ready to transfer a certain number of those shares to him or her as a birthday gift or something like that. Or you make your will and then you give uh, your share in a particular company to certain beneficiaries of your choice. So let us uh, keep uh, in mind. And yes, any question before I move on? Any question before I move on? Okay, so uh, session 42, uh, subsession two, the number of shares in the company and the rights and liabilities attaching to the shares are dependent on the terms of issue. Now this uh, proposition is very important and it's worth uh, some uh, detailed analysis. Now, what Section 42.2 is reminding us is that shares has a bundle of rights and duties or rights and liabilities, right? But the rights and liabilities which accompany a particular share are actually product of agreement or contractual arrangement or consensual arrangement between the company and then the shareholder. And that is why in a particular company, it may so happen that uh, different people have shares in the company, but they have different type of uh, rights and liabilities. And that is why uh, we're talking about uh, types of shares and all the classes of shares and so on uh, later on. So let us keep that in mind. And again, uh, when it's also uh, come to the number of shares uh, which a company may have, if you go to uh, you know the mechanics of incorporation, when we are discussing session thirteen and fourteen, uh, nine nine two uh, in the last semester, uh, we said that where you are a company limited by shares, when you apply for registration, you are supposed to uh, indicate the number of shares uh, which the company is being registered with. Now, there is no ceiling, right? We only have, if we like a minimum, we have a threshold and the threshold is one. So from one up to infinity, you can have as many shares or you can say that the company is registered as many shares as you want. Thousand shares, one million shares, whatever. That is up to you. So let us keep uh, that uh, in mind. Now we move on to another important uh, uh, concept, uh, which we call the concept of no uh, power uh, value uh, shares. So that is session 43. Uh, session 43 makes it quite clear that as far as our jurisdiction, that is Ghana is concerned, 
uh, shares which are created in a company limited by shares or a company which is registered with shares are considered to be shares of no power value. So any share created under you know, this lock at 992 is considered to be a share of no power value. Uh, I'm sure uh, you'll be wondering uh, what is uh, uh, no uh, power value or uh, and so on and so forth. Okay, so before we explain uh, no uh, power value, uh, maybe I think it will be helpful to understand the power value itself so that once we understand the, the concept of power value shares, we'll be able to apply the, 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 the negative and, and say and, and know what such a body three is trying to say. Now, power value uh, share concepts uh, is was quite common in the, in the UK, uh, in the English uh, company law. And this is how it is. That is to say that uh, when shares are created, they have what we call the nominal value. They have like a face uh, value, right? Uh, they have a face uh, value uh, uh, placed uh, on them or stipulated on them. However, when the shares are going to be issued to prospective shareholders, it is not the case that the shares will be sold at the face value, the value which was uh, you know, put on the share at the time that the company registered, right? So what happens is that on the face of the share, or according to the company's constitution, you say that the company is registered with uh, 100,000 shares at one CD, one CD each, meaning that uh, each of the 100,000 shares will be issued at the one CD each. However, under the power value uh, concept in the UK, as I said, when these shares are going to be issued out, it may well be that you give the shares out at let's say two CDs, meaning that the price which you are giving out the shares is higher, it's above the face value. In which case we say that the shares are issued at a premium amount. So there's a premium, premium in the sense that the price you are giving uh, out the share is over and above the face value or like the nominal value. It, it may also happen on the other hand that you have to even go below the face value before you can get people to subscribe for the shares. So instead of giving out the shares at let's say one CD, you may be giving out the shares at uh, let's say 50 pesos per share, in which case, you are giving out the shares at less than 50% of the stipulated face value or the nominal value. Now, where you give out the shares at a price uh, less than the face value, we say that you are giving out at a, at a discount, right? You're giving out a, a discounted the rate or the discount. Now, you can see that there is some confusion and significant artificiality in terms of uh, what the company's construction and registered documents will be saying the unit price of the share is and how much in practice when the shares are being issued out, they are given. So to for so all these confusions to get rid of all these uh, 
inconveniences. Uh, Professor Gawa, when appointed to uh, make proposal for a new company law regime for Ghana in the 1960s, uh, 63 to be specific, he opted for the no power value. And the arguments he advanced are what I have endeavored to explain to you that uh, no power value simplify matters and it obviates the unnecessary uh, confusion of uh, shares issued at a premium at a discount and so on and so forth. Yeah, so uh, if we say that shares are issued uh, at no power value, that is to say that if you are going to register your company in Ghana, you don't need to say that the shares we are registering with, let's say, one million shares at one peso each. That is not really important. That is not really important. Yeah, so uh, let us keep uh, that uh, in mind. Unless someone has a question, otherwise I will move on uh, thinking that you have understood the uh, concept of shares. If you have a question, you just uh, raise up your hand and then we will allow you. Otherwise, we will move on. But maybe the other thing I should have added is that um, you know, when in terms of the price at which uh, shares are actually uh, issued, uh, is determined by demand and supply, right? Just so the demand and supply forces will determine the actual value of uh, the shares, as it were. Of course, that also work in a, a certain uh, unique way depending upon whether the company is a listed company or it's not a listed company. If I say a listed company, that is a company uh, whose shares are traded in on the stock, on the registered stock exchange. And then on listed company, uh, companies, uh, which is outside the stock exchange uh, market. And for that matter, the company will have to uh, find its own means of reaching out to in interested uh, shareholders to subscribe for shares. Yeah, so depending upon the type that you are, uh, then the interaction of demand and supply will operate in a, a unique uh, way. Uh, for example, if, uh, you know, MTN, right? MTN, they made their initial uh, public offering when they were going to be listed on the, the stock exchange and all that. And a lot of people uh, responded to the invitation and they went in and purchased uh, shares. At that time, the price was relatively low, but over time, the value has gone up. Yeah, so that is how uh, it is. Now let's discuss uh, issue of shares. Uh, issue of shares, uh, what is it and what are uh, the rules? As I said, if you have like uh, any uh, question, you have to draw my attention uh, before we move on. And as I told you, I don't want us to be jumping uh, provisions. So we are using the linear approach to discuss uh, all the aspects of the law. Because in reality, that is what we use. Good, so uh, issue of shares. Uh, is a class reader back, session 44. Yeah, anybody?
Okay, so uh, as far as uh, issue of shares is concerned, we must uh, first of all uh, remember that we also have uh, a situation where a company has adopted its own uh, unique con constitution, which is registered. And in that constitution, it may make certain uh, you know, special arrangements regarding the type of shares and so on and so forth, which that company may actually issue. And that is why 441 says, and I quote, subject to the registered constitution of a company, different classes of shares may be issued in a company at the times and for the consideration that the company shall determine and shall be paid for at the times that are agreed between the member and the company. So we have to, first of all, remember that the, our company law give latitude, right? Or give a lot of room of freedom to companies to actually make their own special arrangement. They can, a company which has a registered constitution uh, you know, can put explicitly in the constitution that uh, under no circumstance, uh, maybe special type of shares may be issued and that all shares, as far as that company is concerned, are uniform. So if that is what is stated in the register constitution of the company, that'll be it. And it is not illegal. And that is why Section 24 one actually respects the autonomy of the company to make such provision. And that's why I said that subject to the registered constitution of the company. So subject to means that if some other uh, different or contrary arrangements are made in the registered constitution of a company, they will supersede or they will override uh, what is being stated in this provision. This provision is saying that the company can uh, create different classes of shares, right? That is different category with different rights and liabilities. That is permissible. And then uh, it is also saying that uh, different amount of money, that is the consideration, different amount of money or different value may be extracted from uh, those who are being given shares. And that is something to be decided by the company and nobody else. And again, the time for paying for the value of the shares is also a matter which the company can agree with the shareholder. And if you remember the case of uh, Adishimai Gardens and Asibe, right? Adishimai Gardens and Asibe, which we made last semester, when we we're discussing uh, membership of the company, was quite uh, uh, no, uh, poignant on this particular issue and reinforces the point that, uh, yes, the time for paying for shares, which have actually been uh, given out, allotted to a shareholder, uh, may be agreed upon between the company and the shareholder. And not until that time has actually uh, uh, arrived or elapsed, it will not be right for anybody to blame the shareholder for having defaulted in paying for uh, his or her shares, as you saw in the Adishman Gardens and so on. But all this, which Section 44 1 permits, may be sidestep or may be modified by the company if it so chooses by having it explicitly stated in its own registered constitution. So let us uh, keep that in mind. Now let's move on to uh, 
a related principle in section 44.2 that, quote, on the winding up of the company, every past and present shareholder of the company is liable to contribute to the assets of the company to the extent referred to in section 40. Uh, I'm sure you are uh, wondering uh, what section uh, 40 uh, uh, says. Now, section 40, what, when we're discussing uh, you know, membership of the company, we talk about uh, liability of members, right? So section 40 is about uh, liability of uh, members. And so in terms of liability of members, uh, section 40, give us uh, a more insight and says that, okay, if you are a company limited by shares, then being a member in a company limited by shares, your liability is just the unpaid value in respect of the shares which have been given to you if the company is being wind up and it is, let's say, insolvent. In other words, should it happen that the company has fallen on hard times and is unable to pay for its uh, debts and liabilities as they arise. So let's suppose that uh, liquidation has even kicked in and so forth. And a liquidator is appointed, an official is appointed to superintend or to uh, oversee the liquidation uh, processes and so on. Now, can that official, the liquidator, can he call upon you as a shareholder, as a member in the company of limited by shares to pay money uh, towards meeting the debts and liabilities of the company? The answer is yes. And yes, where the member are not fully paid for the shares, which were issued to that member, right? So if shares were issued to you and you are not fully, issued, I mean, you are not fully paid for shares which were issued to you, then you could be called upon to come and pay the paid liability, right? And that is what section 40, uh, read together with section 44, subsection two, of Act 992 uh, actually reminding us. Then we may also answer the question in the negative and say, no, the liquidator cannot call up to uh, pay more money because you don't owe the company in respect of the shares. You, you, you as at the time that the liquidation happened, you had fully paid for all the shares which you had in the company. So, we cannot be called upon to pay any more money. So all that you stand to lose is that the money that we paid for the shares will never return to you because uh, the company is already uh, insolvent. The company uh, you know, does not have money to be able to pay its creditors. So you lose that. So let us keep that in mind. And of course, uh, we are not discussing company limited by guarantee. Otherwise, if you read section 40 together with section 44, subsection two, you also notice that where you have a company limited by guarantee, uh, the members have actually made undertaking regarding how much money they are prepared to uh, pay uh, towards the debts of the company, uh, should the company be winding up on soon and so forth. That one is also there, but as I said, uh, the bulk of our discussion uh, center around uh, community limited by shares. So we we'll leave that. Any question before we move on the payment of shares? So the takeaway is that the number of shares the community may actually issue is a matter to be decided by the company, right? And it's decided by the company Either the company has its own register constitution, or if it doesn't have, when it is filling the application for registration, then it will specify the number of shares 
with which the company is registered. So anytime the company wants to issue shares, the company must stay within the limits of shares that it was registered with. If the company exhausts that and then it wants to issue out more shares, then the company will need to go through the amendment, right? Uh, go through the, uh, the procedure for amending the constitution of the company. And then you pass a special resolution and then you have uh, you know, the number of shares uh, altered is increased as it were. But not until that is done, the company is bound by the number of shares that it was registered with. Then uh, we've also seen that payment for the shares, that is a consideration uh, for the shares, is a matter of agreement between the company and the shareholder. And what that means is also that uh, shares which are issued at different times may be issued at different prices. The same company, maybe at the time, of course, I have a, uh, shares in the Odotobri Rural Bank, right? Uh, I got bulk of my shares, let's say, within the last uh, 11, you know, 12 years. Now, some uh, other uh, shareholders, right? They had been, some got their shares about 30 years, 25 years. And at that time, the money they paid for their shares were something uh, insignificant uh, with respect to current uh, economic realities. But you have shares in the same company, so you pay different consideration, isn't it? And that is permissible. And that is what Section uh, 44 uh, 1 was telling us about. Okay, so we move on to discuss payment of shares. This is another uh, uh, very uh, important uh, areas uh, which we should uh, pay. Uh, now, before we look at the law and analyze it, we must remember that shares are not issued no, for issuing sake. Shares are not for games. In other words, the company issues shares for a certain purpose. And that purpose is to raise money, right? You give out shares. You give out shares to people and then people bring value to the company. Value which is quantifiable in money terms. So shares go out of the company, then it should bring value to the company so that the company gets capital, the company gets funds to be able to run. So that should be kept in mind. If we have that understanding in mind, then section 45.1 of Act 992 is telling us, and I quote, Except on a capitalization issue, except on a capitalization issue, capitalization uh, uh, underline, I'll explain it uh, in a minute. Let me zoom in a little bit. Um, okay, good. Except on a capitalization issue, pass one to subsection one of session. Uh, 77, uh, shares shall not be issued otherwise than for valuable consideration paid or payable to the company. And unless otherwise agreed, shares shall be paid for in cash. This is a very uh, important uh, 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 provision and we should uh, pay attention to it uh, very well. It's not difficult, so we are going to explain it. And as I said, I want you to understand the law, right? 
once you understand the law, you can use your own language to explain it. Uh, as simple uh, as that. So uh, let's break session uh, 45 uh, down. We come back to the, the caveat, right? We come back to the caveat or the exception, which is in the chapeau, although uh, very soon. So the first thing to notice about uh, session 45 with respect to payment of shares is that uh, shares are issued for valuable information. As I explained, when shares go out of the company to someone, it must bring value to the company. So let us keep that uh, in mind. And two, this valuable consideration may be in the form of cash or non-cash. However, the preferred mode, and let me say, the preferred, that is what the law will wish to be the case all the time is that when people are giving shares, they should give money back to the company. So as I said, that is like the most preferred, but that is not to say that that is the only mode of paying for shares, no, because uh, subject to appropriate uh, disclosures and all that, shares may be paid for uh, in kind, right? That is uh, using non-cash uh, payment, that is permitted. But the, the most preferred method for paying for shares is cash. So let us uh, keep that in mind. Now, we have one major exception, right? One major exception to the principle that whenever shares are issued by the company, uh, valuable consideration in the form of cash, or quantifiable as cash uh, should come to the company uh, as a result of the shares which have been issued. Now, that exception is what we call the capitalization issue. Another word for capitalization issue is what we call the bonus issue, right? So if you hear the word bonus, B-O-N-U-S, bonus, Bonus issue uh, used synonymously or interchangeably with the word capitalization uh, uh, issue. Now, capitalization issue uh, simply means, although it's giving a detailed uh, or a nuanced uh, definition in section 77, uh, which we'll look at uh, as we move on, but for now, a uh, capitalization. Uh, issue simply means that the company issues shares in lieu of payment of dividends. So, capitalization issue is meant for existing shareholders who are entitled to receive dividends from profits which were declared, but for uh, some good reason. The company decided not to uh, distribute the dividends, right, to the shareholders. And in, re no, in lieu or uh, in return for that, the company decides to give more shares to the existing shareholders in proportion to the amount of dividends which will have been paid to each of those shareholders. So, existing shareholders are going to get more shares. Their share number will increase more than uh, the shares they had before the globalization issue was done. However, Nobody is going to ask them to come and pay 
uh, more money to the company. So unlike the usual you know, practice where shares are issued, value should come to the company. You should pay cash or maybe uh, some uh, other you know, provision of services or some other goods which can be quantified in or can be valued in money terms. That is fine. But for bonus issue or capitalization issue, we are saying that it is a, a special type of issuing shares where you issue the shares to present or existing shareholders in lieu of dividends. Dividends refers to the returns, right? Returns that a shareholder is entitled to uh, receive from being a shareholder. So in lieu of dividends, which ought to have been paid to the shareholder, you give the shareholder more shares. So the shares that you are going to give each shareholder is in proportion to the amount of dividends which that shareholder will have received. And let me remind you that all of us may be shareholders, okay? So let's say that you are class, you are about 50. Are you 50, are you are about 50, 55 or 60? Let's say you are 60. You are all shareholders. But when we declare dividends, you not get the same amount of our dividends. The reason being that some have more shares than others. And this is what happens. Let's say that uh, 1 million CDs was declared as well as dividends. And then the company will say that uh, we are going to give uh, each share one CD. So if you have a thousand shares only, the dividend you are going to get is thousand times one. You get the thousand CDs. If someone has got 100,000 shares, the person is going to get 100,000 times one. So you notice that you are all shareholders, but you will not get the same amount of dividends. So by parity of reason, where capitalization issue is done, shares are being issued uh, instead of payment of dividends, then you are also going to get the number shares equivalent to the amount of dividends you have received if dividends had actually been given out. And that is what you call a capitalization issue. Are we, has somebody got a question on that before we move on? Any question on that before we move on? No, sir. Okay. Hello, sir. Yes, please. Go ahead. So, sir, the bonus shares, uh, that is to say it is the capitalization of, of, of the company. Uh, uh, please. Hello, sir. You said the bonus share that... Can the, you say the, that bonus shares, the bonus yes. shares. The bonus shares. Yeah. Yes. So, what, what it means is that when a company issues a bonus shares, it means that the money is not going out, but rather it is recapitalized into the company. Is that, is that the case? Yes. Yes. So you see, yes, that, that, that is it. Now, the company has made a uh, profit. And let's say that according to the company's own constitution or whatever resolution they have in force, uh, dividends should have been declared. But sometimes, the company may need more money. That's why the fact that it has made profit and dividends are going to be declared. The company may need money for expansion, right? Or for meeting certain strategic uh, goals. Let me give you an example. Let's suppose you are a company, let's say like you're a bank, right? Uh, you're a bank and at some point in time, as part of the... Uh, aggressive uh, regulation by Bank of Ghana uh, to try and solve the various problems that uh, we have in the banking sector, in the economy and all that. They decided to increase the, what you call, 
uh, the stated capital, right? For different uh, uh, tiers of banks and so on. So let's say that uh, they have raised your stated capital to, let's say, 400 million. Now, before the Bank of Ghana as a regulator issued the directive that all, uh, let's say, tier one banks or universal bank or whatever should have a minimum capital of uh, 400 uh, million. Let's suppose until that, the, your own uh, city capital was, let's say, 300, uh, 300 uh, million. As, as, excuse me, let me just a, a minute. Yeah, I'm, I'm finishing it. All right, okay. But I'm finishing the class in 20 minutes. Anyway. Yeah, so uh, you were doing uh, three, uh, 300 million. Now, there's a directive that uh, within a certain uh, period, you are supposed to actually uh, reach 400 million. So you come to your shareholders and say that uh, in order to ensure that we get this uh, money and we don't uh, actually bring in new shareholders, right? We want the existing shareholders to continue to enjoy maybe a certain profit, which is going to be made in the foreseeable future and all that. So let us sacrifice now. So profit, which we should have shared, let us plow it back into the company. And in, because we have some, some, some of the shares which are unissued, we are going to issue you uh, more shares. Yeah, so that, that, that is it, you are right. It's like, if you like, recapitalizing. Any other? Okay, so uh, let's look at the subsection uh, two. Yeah, so subsection to where a company agrees to accept payment for shares, otherwise than wholly in cash. The company shall within 28 days after the allotment of the shares deliver to the registrar for registration, a contract in writing uh, duly Do list them, evidencing the terms of the agreement and the true value of the consideration. Or if the agreement has not reduced writing, uh, particulars in prescribed form of the agreement, do list them as if it were a written agreement. Now, we have already uh, mentioned that it is permissible for a company to accept uh, payments, right? It's permissible for community to accept uh, payments uh, in the form of uh, non-cash, that is uh, payment uh, in kind, as it were. But there's a risk of abuse. There's a risk of abuse there. And what is, uh, can anybody tell me the, the risk of abuse where you are accepting non cash payment for issue of shares. Can anybody uh, hazard an opinion? What is potential abuse there? Anybody? Maybe uh, the item that a person may bring will be overvalued. For example, mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, if a, a person is bringing a car and go ahead to overvalue the car, it means that the value itself that 
uh, you subtract that shares, will be less than the car that he brought. Okay, all right. Okay, that, 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 is, that is good, yes. So uh, we don't want situation where uh, people are giving more shares and then they give something uh, relatively small in value, right, to the company. So, to, yes, to guard against that, the lawmaker would like uh, you no know, details of the agreement under which the company accepted non-cash payment for shares uh, to be made available and be registered with the registered companies within 28 days. So practically within a, a, a one month, uh, as it were, that you should register it so that uh, if later we'll be discussing uh, corporate restructuring, insolvency, and liquidation and order, should it happen that the company is, for example, undergoing uh, you know, liquidation, a liquidator is appointed, the liquidator can go through the books of the company and also go to the register general to find out details of non-cash payment for shares. Now, if the, if the, the liquidator, for example, uh, gets to know that the particular non-cash agreement, uh, which was made between the company and the shareholder was something uh, which is really uh, detrimental to the company in the sense that the person gave less and the company gave more shares to that person. Now, the liquidator can apply for revaluation, right? Revaluation of whatever was given as the non cash payment. And uh, the deficit, the difference between what ought to have been paid as a proper value and what was actually paid, the liquidator can uh, ask the particular shareholder to come and pay if you like the, the, the difference. So that is part of the reason why the lawmaker would like proper disclosure to be made regarding the non-cash uh, payment. But there's another thing I also like to draw your attention to. Uh, if you look at section 45, it makes the point that if the agreement has not been reduced to writing, particularly in a prescribed form of agreement, this time, I think it was written agreement and registered. Now, it should not be strange for you to appreciate that in deserving situations, Oral agreement, parole contract can be used to issue uh, a contract and to, to issue shares. And remember the case of Ozzy Air and Darko. Ozzy Air and Darko, uh, which uh, we alluded to uh, last uh, semester. Especially if you look at the decision of uh, Justice Batiba and also Professor Modibo Okran, uh, how the uh, reason differently on whether an important transaction like issue of shares or like a promise to issue uh, shares, whether it could be by oral contracts or it must always be uh, in writing. Uh, so if you did not read uh, that case, uh, please go back and read the case of uh, Ozzy uh, and Darko. And again, you notice that uh, subsection 3, uh, 45 3, excludes capitalization issue. Capitalization issue, one would argue, is a, if you like, a certain type of 
non-cash uh, payment for shares. And for that matter, if non-direct non cash payment for shares are supposed to be fully disclosed and uh, all that, then uh, how different uh, is it for how different is it for uh, uh, what do you call it the uh, capitalization issue? But as uh, we've been explaining, capitalization issue is a, uh, a bit different, and for that matter, it is not treated like a normal non-cash uh, payment, uh, you know, transaction for share as it were. So let us keep that uh, in mind. And you know the point that I made that uh, where there is you no know, overvaluation of the non-cash in the situation of uh, liquidation, uh, the liquidator uh, under now the corporate uh, insolvency and restructuring act, which has replaced the body's corporate official liquidation act, who, for example, uh, take the necessary step and let the, the shortfall or the difference uh, be paid. So look at section 45, subsection uh, four. Any question uh, so far? Okay. We will uh, end the class here, continue uh, tomorrow with students and continue the following day with the company law. Unless you have a question, otherwise I will leave you here and have a, a good night. Uh, maybe uh, let me attend. I have a, I have some uh, quiz on the topic that we have done. So to put you on your toes. What I intend to do is that before we continue the next class, I will screen the, the quiz and then you do it. So as soon as you finish, we share the answers and then you know how well you are failing. So uh, read what we have done and then get ready for quiz on it at our next uh, company law class. Thank you.